open your Bibles to the book of Ruth. It's in your Old Testament. We started last week in our series in the book of Ruth, and uh, we're just taking it a chapter at a time, which is kind of a big chunk of of, um, scripture to take. And so, um, but but we're 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 going through it. What a neat story! And, And last week, chapter one of Ruth, boy, it was kind of a dark. Um, message. It was kind of a dark chapter. It was a, a chapter that, that describes and, and provides a, a picture of just pain and um, suffering and a feeling of hopelessness that, that came a, a, about. We were introduced to a family um, living in one of the most unfaithful and dark times in Israel's history. And unfortunately, um, their family story was that uh, early on of tragedy after tragedy after tragedy that took place. Um, there was a famine in the land of, of Bethlehem where they were living, and, uh, and rather than, than seeking the Lord, we learned last week, Elimelech, uh, the, the head of the house, the father, moves his family to a foreign country, to a, to a pagan people, and a pagan land, and, and they get there, and then he dies. And his sons get married, and then his, uh, his sons die. And so we're left with mom and the two, mother-in-law, uh, the two daughter-in-laws who were both uh, f- uh, Moabites. They were both uh, women uh, that were uh, foreign to the nation of Israel. They were not Israelites. And then uh, they decide, Naomi, the, the, the wife and, and mother, decides to move back to Israel, back to Bethlehem. And we see that, that uh, one of the daughter-in-laws goes back at her request back to her own people in Moab, but Ruth continues on and journeys on with uh, Naomi. And that's just to catch you up real briefly. I encourage you, if you missed last week, please, please, please go read chapter one of Ruth. Uh, it's such an incredible start to this story, and it really sets up what we're going to be talking about um, this morning in chapter two. Um, Ruth and Naomi become kind of the central sto- uh, central figures of the story now, along with a guy that we're going to meet along the way here today. Uh, but Ruth here, remember where we found, uh, where, where we left off last week, Naomi, she, her, which her name, Naomi, means sweet and pleasant. She got back home to Bethlehem, and they are like, all the people of Bethlehem, her hometown, were like, Naomi, in other words, sweetness has come back. Right? Pleasantness has come back. Naomi has returned, and she says, don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara, which means bitter. I am bitter because of how the Lord has dealt with me. She finds herself in this hopeless, bitter state. On the flip side, we find her daughter-in-law, Ruth, full of hope and faith in the midst of some pretty incredible tragedy. Chapter, uh, ch- chapter two of Ruth couldn't be any f- more different than chapter one. Really, the purpose of chapter one is to help us realize how big our need is. And chapter two's purpose is to show us how big our God is. And so today, we're going to take a look at how God provides in God's provision and how we can have hope in God's provision, that we can have confidence in our God, and we can trust him that he is at work, even if, it, even if right now we are in the middle of a difficult season, even if we're in the midst of suffering, we're in the midst of trial and trouble right now, we have a God that's at work in the midst of that, writing a beautiful story that is going to, uh, if we w- continue to walk in faith and hope, is going to be incredible. Before we jump into chapter two, there's this there's statements that, that become common, and I don't even know how they become common, but all of a sudden, and every once in a while, you start hearing a new statement thrown out, and it seems like everybody starts using it. And one that is fairly common that, that gets used often is this. You've heard it before. It is what it is, Right? And usually, when is that statement brought up, right? It's in the middle of, you know, you just found out some bad news, or you just found out something's not going to work out, and, 
And uh, you hear that statement says, well, it is what it is, right? Yeah, it is what it is. It is what it is, right? And, and we've used that before, and people I've heard say that, and, 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 and typically it's just this kind of hands up, like, you know what? I wish it was different, but it is what it is, you know? Where ah, I got this, this health stuff going on, and ah, it is what it is. You know, I wish my marriage was different. I wish that my spouse and I were getting along better, but you know what? It is what it is. You know, I wish that this project or that, that, my, that, 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 my, that I'm on on my job, you know, I wish that things were going better and that I was able to, to get home on time and, but it didn't consume so much time, but you know what? It is what it is. And it's this throwing up of hands, right, saying, you know what? It is what it is. What's done is done. What is what it is. And what we're going to find today is that that statement is so against what the Bible talks about. That this, it is what it is type mentality, that's not the kind of God we serve. Because so far we've seen in this story already, we've seen Naomi, who we talked about, she's done this. She's thrown up her hands and she says, it is what it is. My God has dealt bitter with me. Don't call me Naomi anymore. It is what it is. I'm just destined to be widowed. I'm destined to be poor and destitute my whole life. It is what it is. What a lack of faith. On the flip side, we see Ruth, who does not just sit down and say, it is what it is. But rather, she steps out in faith, and she believes, whether she can articulate it at this time or not, she knows deep down within her that it is not just what it is, but with God it is what it could be. And she hasn't seen what God has already won for her. And so we're going to see this story unfold, and it's a beautiful story. And I just want you to think about this. How big is your God? Because if we go, you know what, it is what it is. My relationships, my, my marriage, my, my work, my whatever, just what it is, what it is. If that statement defines how you live your life, I guarantee your picture of God is very, very small. Much like Naomi's was. And I want to challenge you, and I hope that this chapter challenges you to expand your view of God and not settle for it is what it is, but believe with all that's within you that with God, it's not it is what it is, it is what it could be, and it is what he has planned, and it is the story that he's writing. Verse one. Now Naomi had a relative of her husband, a worthy man of the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth, the Moabite, said to Naomi, let me go out into the field and glean among the ears of grain after him in whose sight I shall find favor. And she said to her, go, my daughter. So she set out and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was the clan of Elimelech. Let's stop right there and just, what is going on here? Okay, we have, to, we have to break this down because this story, we're distanced by a little bit of time and a culture here. And so uh, in order to understand the significance of some of what's going on, we have to kind of break down what's happening. The very first um, verse speaks of this man named Boaz. And it talks about Boaz in this, in, the, to, to, in a way that emphasizes his greatness, right? It calls him a, a worthy man, 
of the clan. Some translators say a mighty man of valor. And if you remember, uh, that's the statement from a few weeks ago when we talked about Gideon, right? Um, that's the, the, the angel of the Lord came to Gideon, called him a mighty man of valor. And, and so here we're talking about a guy, um, the, this phrase here, a worthy man, uh, often is also translated as warrior or uh, Someone who uh, is, is of good reputation with integrity and honor. He was a man of great power in the city, as we'll see as the story unfolds. And he was also a man of wealth. He owns fields. He was an incredible man. And we're going to see him in the rest of this story and how incredible Boaz really was. Um, you know when you're kids and... Uh, and you, like, you started making something up, like making words up that, to, like, to, to be cool, right? Um, like, you would describe things that were cool in a different way than, like, just saying, oh, that's cool. You know, like, um, I don't know, rad, rad uh, awesome. Awesome is pretty common still today. But, um, uh, this one, and now you guys are going to make fun of me for this, because, like, I grew <laughs> a preacher's kid and uh, went to church camps, and, and one year at church camp, um, we were learning about the story of Ruth, and, and somebody thought that, uh, that it was, and we were talking, like, I'm in fourth or fifth grade, right, and somebody thought that we should describe things that are cool as Boaz, right? <laughs> So all week long, like if something was really cool, it'd be like, dude, that's so Boaz right there, right? Now that's ridiculous, right? But, but like we got the picture, even as fourth and fifth graders, that when it comes to like this guy Boaz, he defines coolness. He defines awesomeness. He defines like what it means to be an awesome dude. Right? So that's, you, you're, you, can, you can take that. Like, you could go try that at work tomorrow if you wanted to and just see how it rolls over. Like, that's so Boaz, right? And we thought we were so cool by saying that too. And we were like, it all week at church camp. And then we come home from church camp and we go, like, try to use that around some other kids that, that weren't at church camp with us. And they're like, you're not so Boaz, right? That's not cool at all. Um, and people are looking at us like, you're really weird, and I agree with them now. <laughs> that was just for free. That wasn't even in my notes. Um, but just something more you can make fun of me. But, 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 but Boaz was this awesome guy, this incredible godly man, a worthy man. Conversely, the second verse reminds us that Ruth is lacking. It reminds us that Ruth is a, a Moabite woman a foreigner now in the land of Israel, in the town of Bethlehem. And she would have stuck out from the rest. She was not only a foreigner, but she was a widow. Even within the very law of Moses, the very law that governed the people of God at that time, she would have been marginalized and looked down upon by most of the town. Ruth was helpless, but she was not hopeless. She didn't just sit and say, you can tell she didn't just sit and, like her mother-in-law say, it is what it is. She rather, she says to her mother-in-law, she says, let me go into the field and glean the ears of grain after whose sight I shall, fi uh, I shall find favor. And, her and, and um, Naomi says, go, my daughter. Now, this was a very common practice among that time. In fact, you'll see it in uh, the, the Old Testament, in Leviticus and Deuteronomy. God actually set this up. This was in the law um, of God's way of providing for the poor who could not um, provide for themselves. And what they would do is when they would harvest the fields, they wouldn't 
level the whole field. They would leave a little um, bit around the outside of the field where the poor and the, the destitute of the town could come and they could glean the harvest from the outside part of the field and that would provide for them that they could eat. And that was God's way. It was what the law of Moses said. And so um, this field that was happening and so uh, Ruth goes out there and begins to do that. Unfortunately, um, many people who followed the law of God did that, but they didn't follow the law of God that, that said that, that they shouldn't harm or abuse the ladies who do that. And so to some degree, it was a little bit of a dangerous thing for Ruth to go out there um, amongst a bunch of men laboring in the fields. Um, and so she goes out and she begins to do that and, and take, now it's really cool. This is God's way of um, providing uh, for them. And he promises, if you look in Deuteronomy, he promises that, it would, that he would further bless the, the owner of the field who left that. And it also provided that people could work at that time for their own food. And it was a way that they could have dignity and work and, and have something to eat. Yeah. Then verse three says this. So she set out and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz of the clan of Elimelech. So she just, she just happens to come to this field. Now, the way that it's written here, it makes us, it sounds like, you know what, she's just, she kind of luckily stumbles upon this field. But really, the, the writer here, when they're using kind of a, um, a literary tool that, that's uh, kind of a hyperbole here, like, it wasn't that she just so happened, like, that, that, that it was actually she was, um, she was led to this field. Not by any person, but that she, as she was walking along, God, the Spirit of God led her into this place, into this field, into this, this place where he would provide. And this begins to redefine a little bit of, and, and, and shed some light on God's provision and how he guides and directs the lives of, of his people that he moves throughout the storyline of human history and guides and directs and provides for not only Ruth here, but it's going to show us today how he's been working and guiding and moving in our story as well. Think about this. It just so happens. It just happens. Think about all the things that just happened so far in this story. Ruth and Naomi just happened to come back to Bethlehem at the time of the barley harvest this harvest would be marked by the celebration at the beginning of by Passover. And so it would be, they'd come back into the town right in the middle of this celebration where God's people are focused on memorializing and remembering what God had done for them. It just so happens that, um, that Ruth comes to the field of Boaz, who is, happens to be, just happens to be the most eligible bachelor in all the town, we'll come to find out, right? And who's a godly man who cares. He just happens, so happens to come uh, that um, Boaz shows up. And it all happens in this town of Bethlehem where we all know the, what that will later become, the town of where our, our Savior was born. And I just want you to think about your life. Because as you look back in, our, in your life, can you identify the just so happens that have taken place in your life that have led you to the place where you are today? Think back through your story and how God has been orchestrating and moving in your story. And some of the things that at the time just seem lucky or seem like pure chance. I think when you go back and you begin looking at it through the eyes that God works through people, I think you begin to see, oh, God was directing my path and watching over my steps the whole way through. Just so happens and that God is working together the events 
that are happening in your life right now. Even the, the, the pain and the struggle and the, the trial, he's working the events of your present to bring about the accumulation of his providential plan that he's trying in his story that he's gonna write later on down the road. And I want you to think about how many times, how many times you thought it was the end of the world? How many times you thought like in high school, middle school, college, were you like, this is the end of the world, man. This is just, this is terrible. This is just, I, I can't believe this happened. This is the end of the world. This is just, I can't, I'm not gonna be able to survive this one. And how God's used that part of your story to guide and direct and move and shape your life to what it's like now. He's working in your life, whether you see it or feel it right now or not. Verse four. And behold, Boaz from the, uh, came from Bethlehem, and he said to the reapers, the Lord be with you, and they answered, the Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to the young man who was in charge of the reapers, who, uh, whose young woman is this? And the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered, she is the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. She said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves after the reapers. So she came and she has continued from early morning until now except for a short rest. Then Boaz said to Ruth, now listen, my daughter, do not go glean in any other field or leave this one, but, uh, but keep close to my young women. Let your eyes be on the field that they are reaping and go after them. Have uh, have I not charged the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessel and drink what the, uh, the young men have drawn. Then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground and said, why have I found favor in your eyes? And why should, uh, and, and you, that you take notice of me since I am a foreigner? Let's pause there for a second. So Boaz arrives uh, just as Ruth is about to leave the field, and uh, another just so happens, right? He, he shows up, and he doesn't recognize her, so he inquires of the foreman, uh, what's, you know, what, who is she? Whose wife or whose daughter is she? And the, the foreman doesn't know her name, but certainly knows her story. He says it's the, that Moabite girl um, who came back with Naomi, and uh, I think everybody in the town would have known who she was, who, uh, who, who, like not her name, but the story that goes behind it. Certainly it's gone all around town that Naomi's back. She brought with her the, um, her daughter-in-law and uh, that she was a foreigner. I don't know, it probably went a little bit something like this. And Boaz came up to the foreman and was like, hey, who is, who's, that, who's that girl out there? I don't know. So that, I think she's a Moabite, that Moabite that came back, you know, with Naomi, that came back with Naomi? I don't know, she came out and she asked if, like, she could, she could glean from the fields, and I, I told her, whatever, go out there and do your thing. But notice what he says then. He says, but she's been working really hard all day. Like, she kept going and going and going, and only a short little break for water, and then she went, got right back after it. The foreman recognized Ruth's work ethic, recognized her heart and her passion for providing for Naomi. And Boaz recognizes it as well. So he comes up to her and stops her and he, he invites her to glean from not just the outskirts of the field anymore, he invites her to glean from his very own field and to hang out with his, uh, the, the women that were, were working for him and to, 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 to be a part of the group, to come and get what she needed, to drink water freely, not having to go pull her own water, but just, hey, just, you see the guys, they, they pulled water. You don't need to go do that. You, you just go drink from them and I, they're, not gonna, they're not gonna mess with you. I've already told them, no one better be messing with you. And she is just overwhelmed by this. Think about it. I mean, when we read it, it's just right in there, but, but think about 
how Naomi must have been feeling. Not Naomi, Ruth must have been feeling in this story. She is not only in a different place, a different town, she is in a completely different culture. So far away from home. She's widowed. Her husband, there are no men to provide for them. They've been hungry. They're just two widow ladies living by themselves. And she spent all day in a field where I'm sure she's been gawked at and looked down upon and pointed at. Oh, that's that Moabite. Because she stands out from the rest. And now this guy Boaz comes up and she's, he says, come into the inner circle. Come be part of my community. You may not be welcome in the rest of Israel's community, but come be a part of my community. And she's overwhelmed by this compassion. She falls on her face and begins to, to worship. She feels unworthy, unloved, but yet she's just found somebody that was going to welcome her in. And her question is kind of like, why would you do this? Why would you, why would you do this for me? Ruth's response is, what a genuine response to grace looks like, right? When we are overwhelmed by the love of God, when we felt unworthy, unloved, unredeemable, and Jesus shows up and redeems us, what her reaction is is probably a pretty good reaction to what we should have going on the inside. What are, wow. Why would you do this for me? We see Ruth here. The story of Ruth and consequently, Naomi begins to change with this one conversation with Boaz. Let's keep reading. Verse 11. But Boaz answered her, all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me and how you left your father and mother in your native land and you've came to the people you did not know before. The Lord repay you for what you have done and a full reward be given you by uh, the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Then she said, I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, uh, for you have uh, comforted me and spoke kindly to your servants, though I am not one of your own servants. And uh, at mealtime, Boaz said to her, come here and eat some bread and dip your morsel in the wine. So she sat beside the reapers and he passed uh, to her the roasted grain and she ate until she was satisfied and she had some left over. When she rose to glean, Boaz instructed his men saying, let her glean even among the sheaves and do not reproach her uh, and also pull out some of the bundles for her and leave it for her to glean uh, and do not rebuke her. So she gleaned in the field until evening. Uh, then she beat out what she had gleaned and it was about uh, an ephah of barley. Let's pause right there. What an incredible little scene that we have. I hope that as I read that, you were able to picture in your mind just as, as a movie scene unfolding because it's such a beautiful picture of, of redemptive grace in response to incredible faith. What do I mean by that? Boaz, she's like, why would you do this for me? And he says, I've heard, I've heard what you've been doing. I've heard your story. I've heard that you left your father and mother, your family back home, your foreign gods back home, and you came to just provide and be a part of what God's doing here. How you've walked beside your mother-in-law and you never let her down and you've, you've come and you've taken care of her. And now you're out here working hard to provide for food for your mother-in-law You've shown your faith. 
not only in your mother-in-law, but you've shown faith in God. No doubt he's heard that she said that what we read last week, right? Your God will be my God. Your people will be my people. So he says, listen, you have seen, I have seen in you incredible faith. And so because of that, I want to pour out grace. I want to pour out blessing upon you. I want to help you out. So he invites her for dinner. And think about that statement. She ate until she was satisfied. Ruth may have not been able to eat until she was satisfied since her husband had died. Back home in Moab. She's been on the road. They didn't have a lot of food. They had no money. And yet this, she is able to eat and be satisfied. So much so that then she was able to, she was able to keep some and per, take it home to, to Naomi. Boaz here is a picture of generosity, the generosity of God on display. That God's provision in our lives and in lives of people doesn't often just fall out of the sky into the laps of needy people. Sometimes he does. But more often, he uses people to provide generously for other people in need. He takes people who have much or have enough and through generosity provides for those who don't. That Boaz is really a partnering with God here to bless Ruth and Naomi. We talked about generosity a few weeks ago here. And really this is a picture of what God's asking a lot of times us to do as his church and us to do as his people. It's to provide generously for other people, to be his hands and feet, to be his picture of grace upon grace to people who are in need. It's one of the reasons that we did Trunk or Treat um, is just to, to be involved with people, but it's really one the primary reason we do the Thanksgiving boxes is because there are needy people in our neighborhood and, and surrounding areas that, that, uh, that don't know what it's like to have a full meal on Thanksgiving. And so we get an opportunity to bless them, to, to, to be Boaz for them, and to just bring food for them so that they can sit around and hopefully it would, it would spark generosity. It would, it would spark conversation around, man, why would this church, why would, why would this church just bring me food? And hopefully we get an opportunity to, to share the grace of God, which is the reason why we share food. Again, the question is why, though, why is Boaz doing this? Why would Boaz go out of his way to do this? What's interesting is Boaz, if you read through the genealogy, Boaz's mom was Rahab. If you remember the story, when the nation of Israel comes into Jericho, they send spies into Jericho to see what's, uh, how, to, how, how fortified the city is comes into the city and, uh, and their spies hide in the house of a prostitute named Rahab, a foreign, foreigner, and a prostitute. And she says, remember me when you tear down, when, the, when God, your God tears down this city. The walls fall down, her section stays up, she lives, she marries an Israelite man and has a son named Boaz. Boaz sees this foreign girl, but sees her heart. She doesn't just dismiss her automatically because of the way she looks or what culture she comes from. She see, he sees her heart because his mom had the same heart, a foreign woman who had the same heart for God, a same faith in the God of the Bible. And so he saw her and had compassion on her and brought her into the inner chamber, in, into just kind of the fellowship and the community there. My question is, is, who is God asking you to 
look at, who the world has marginalized, who maybe the world's looked down upon, who've just been written off just because of the way they look or the way they talk or the way they act. Who is God calling you to show generosity to that the world has pushed away? Because you never know how that might change their story. We learn an incredible lesson from this guy named Boaz. We also see in this story on the other side how God has been moving in Ruth's life and in Naomi's life to bring about and guided and directed their life to accomplish this purpose. God, it's God who ordains where we walk and how we, and and the places we go and he's seen it and he knows our story. The book of Acts, verse, uh, chapter 17 says, and he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and boundaries for their dwelling place. God has ordained your life. Therefore, your life is not just, it is what it is. It's not okay and to just say, you know what? It is what it is. This is just how it's going to be, how it's going to, no. He says, I want you to begin to step out and walk in faith, knowing that I have directed and I have plans for you to, 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 to move in your life, plans to, to make things happen. And, and, and if you will continue to walk in faith, and I've already seen your path, and I've already worked through the details, God, God has already ordained how long we live and when we die. God has ordained what we look like and how we act and think. He's ordained our, he's given us our own personality. He's ordained who we were raised by, our parents. Think about that. He ordained that that Boaz was raised by Rahab who comes in to redeem this foreign girl Ruth into the family of God in whom we learn later on, right? We learned last week that through Ruth and through Boaz and through, uh, through Rahab, the prostitute, Jesus is born. He's redeeming the story of mankind because he's ordained the story of of mankind. It's not just it is what it is anymore with God. He's got plans for you. And now this is not a, this is not some, God's providence isn't isn't an excuse to be paralyzed, right? To be paralyzed by God's providence so we just sit back and say, well, since God's got everything ordained, I think I'm just gonna sit here and watch how it unfolds. No, that's not how it works at all, right? That's what, that's what Naomi was doing. He's just sitting. He, he wants us to be like Ruth, to get up and to continue to walk in faith and to continue to, to, um, to, to live out he wants us to be free to live and make decisions and have risk and have no fear and, and to walk and to not avoid relationships and to continue to, to pursue people and to go out there and be bold for his name knowing that he is already leading in that area. It's what he does for Ruth and it, what he wants to do for our own lives. Now, that's not to say that we can blame God for every dumb and bad excuse you've ever made, but he's already seen your dumb and bad mistakes and he's figured out how to, re- to redeem your story. So if you're sitting in here this morning and saying, you know what, I've made too many errors, I've made too many mistakes, God couldn't possibly use someone as broken as me if he can use a prostitute named Rahab to get married to a man, an Israelite man, and have a have a son named Boaz and raise a son in such a way that he looks at the outcast and the overlooked that he would go and invite Ruth in a Moabite woman a woman whose culture meant saw sacrificing children as okay he can definitely take your life even in the midst of the mistakes you've made redeem them for his glory and do something powerful with your life continue to walk and faith. Verse 18. And she took it up uh, and went into the city, and her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned, and she also brought out and gave her what food she had left over from being satisfied. And her mother-in-law said, where did you glean today? And where have you worked? Blessed is the man who took notice of you. 
So she told her mother-in-law uh, with whom she had worked and said, the, uh, the man's name with whom I work today is Boaz. And Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, may he, may he be blessed by the Lord whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. Naomi also said to her, the man is a close relative of ours, one of our redeemers. And Ruth the Moabite said, uh, besides, he said to me, you shall keep close to my uh, young men until they have finished all my harvest. And Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, it is very good, my daughter, that you go out with the young women, lest uh, in another field you may be assaulted. So she kept close to the young women of Boaz, gleaning until the end of the barley and wheat harvest. She lived with her mother-in-law. Hope begins to return for Naomi, doesn't it? In this moment, through the faith of Ruth, going out and doing and, and, and putting feet to her actions, to just get out there and work hard and, and to, to get out there and have faith in God, hope begins to come back to Naomi. She gets excited again. She's saying, oh, this is... This is incredible. God's writing this story. Ruth re re returns with enough uh, flour to feed them for weeks. This is, she returns with 10 times the amount that, that Naomi ever thought she'd come back with. And then the invitation to come back and, and uh, continue to work, if, if, she if she continues on that pace, if, if Ruth's able to continue on that pace, she's going to be able to provide food for, for them for, for over a year. That's how much flour she's been able to get. It's pretty incredible. But if that's all that it was, their, her, their, their situation hasn't really changed that much, have, has it? I mean, they got food now, so I guess they won't die of starvation. That I means they can have bread every day. But there's still two widowed ladies living in Israel, they don't have a way of making money for themselves. Um, they're still living alone. They're still surviving day to day. They needed more relief than this, right? This was a good start. But they needed more relief than just some flour. And for us, in our lives, um, there's no real hope if God's, um, in, if God's plan is to just temporarily relieve our suffering and our trials here on earth. If all it is is just this kind of satisfy our stomachs as we go and just temporarily satisfy, there's really no a lot of lasting hope. We need our situations to be transformed completely, don't we? And that's what that's what Ruth and Naomi needed. It's what we need. If we've lost, <laughs> um, if we lose the ability to use our arms and legs and we're drowning in a sea of piranhas, somebody yelling at instructions for us to swim don't really, doesn't really help us, right? We need somebody to come jump in and get into our mess and save us out of our mess, we need a rescuer, we need a redeemer. And more than being excited about just some flour that was brought home by, by Ruth, Naomi was excited because she's found a redeemer. She's found somebody that was going to, to be able to potentially redeem their stories and provide for them both. Boaz was a kinsman redeemer, meaning that in the law of Moses, he was one of the men charged with the responsibility to, to rescue and redeem their story. And we're going to see that play out in the next chapter a lot more. Uh, it's just kind of a, a teaser for next chapter. But Boaz here is going to be a picture of Jesus. Boaz ultimately pictures Jesus, and that's so Boaz. <laughs> A man of, uh, a great man with power who enters into our suffering 
and buys us back, who enters into our suffering and into our stories and into our broken places when we were alone and destitute, without hope, Jesus enters our story and provides us hope again. And it's more than just a temporarily easing of our situation on earth. He gives us hope for life, life abundant and life eternal. And he looks at us much like Boaz looks upon Ruth where she felt unlovable, unworthy, and unredeemable. And at times, friends, and maybe some of you are sitting there today, and that's how you feel. Jesus looks at you, and he invites you in, just as Boaz does. He wants to forgive your sins and cleanse you of all unrighteousness and remove your fear and your shame and bring you to a place of healing and hope again. He provides for us a living hope. I love the way Peter describes this. In 1 Peter chapter 1, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled, reserved in heaven for you. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials so that you know that the testing of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it's tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, you believe in him. And rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. That's what we have in Jesus. We have a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And much like Ruth needed a redeemer, we need a redeemer. We need somebody that's going to buy us back. Somebody who's going to step into our mess and deliver us. And if you're here today and you have not made Jesus the Lord of your life, if you have not invited him to be your redeemer, you need to do that. You need Jesus to step in your life. And if you've never made that decision, I would love to talk with you afterwards because it's the most important thing you can do. But the truth is that many of us have have already done that And we're still walking in a time for some of us and for some reason, we're walking through a time of suffering or of trial in our lives, whether that's relationship or physical uh, pain or, or family stuff or whatever's going on in your life. And we're so tempted to just sit down and say, you know what? It is what it is. What's done is done. I guess this is just how my life's gonna be. And I want to challenge you that that that's not faith. That that's not the story that God wants to write. God's got a bigger story in mind for you. So let's stop saying it is what it is. And let's start walking in faith saying, you know what? With God, all things are possible. And yes, the situation I find myself in right now, it's not the greatest. But I serve a really, really big God who if he's able to orchestrate Ruth's story like this, he's certainly able to orchestrate mine and continue to walk and do the right thing and walk in faith, knowing that God is orchestrating and ordaining our lives and he's ordaining our stories for his glory and his fame and his renown. So keep hope in that. Keep faith. God's got something big for you. Let's pray. God, thank you. Thank you for this. And God, as we come right now into this time where we're going to celebrate communion together, where we're just going to celebrate who and what you've done, God, I just pray that you would bring to memory how you've worked in our stories to this point. 
and how you will continue to work in our story to this moving forward. God, thank you for Jesus, his name.